All right. Well, maybe uh, maybe we'll get started up. So uh, we're happy to welcome today uh, another candidate interviewing today, and this is uh, Dr. Yujia Jung, <laughs> uh, who's visiting us. Um, she did her uh, her bachelor's in, in uh, Beijing in geophysics. She did a PhD at Stanford University and uh, is now uh, doing a postdoc at Caltech. Well, it's better on than ever. <laughs> um, and so uh, she does a lot of interesting things with uh, ground deformation data from INSAR remote sensing and relates it to all kinds of natural uh, processes in the earth, earthquakes, uh, other natural processes, as well as man-made processes like aquifer drawdown and other things. And I'm sure she's going to hit on some of those subjects. So everybody, I think, knows the the drill, we'll, we'll, you'll be meeting uh, Eugenia today and tomorrow, uh, either on one-on-ones or group interviews. To, I think the undergraduates will have lunch with you today and tomorrow the graduate students will have lunch with you. And then of course, um, let's say by Thursday-ish, if I can get feedback from everybody on the visit, uh, that would be great. So uh, we are, we have everybody here. We have a bunch of people online and then the link to the recording will be sent out later today too. So with that, let's welcome you, Gia. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I'll go ahead and get started. My topic today is how we can use a technique called space form imaging radar to deepen our understandings of the many Earth system processes that change the shape of the Earth. There is a lot that we still don't understand about the many surface and subsurface processes that change the shape of the Earth. For example, earthquakes. How, what is the relationship between cold seismic and cold seismic activities? And what can it tell us about the rheological properties of the crust and the upper mantle? Volcanoes, how big are magma chambers and how are the magmatic reservoirs connected? Glaciers, how fast are they um, moving and in what way is the grounding line migrating? Water resources, are we using water in a sustainable way, especially in the context of rapidly growing population and climate change? Can we identify small shifts in buildings, railroads, pipelines, and dams to prevent disasters? And after a natural disaster, after a fire or a flood or earthquakes, can we assess damage in a timely manner? To answer all these questions, the ability to comprehensively observe our planet is really important. And in today's talk, I'll demonstrate first with two examples of how we can understand subsurface processes such as Cascadia slowslip events and tropical earthquakes in Sierra Negra volcano um, by measuring their surface deformation. I'll then discuss an emerging area of research in remote sensing, that is how we can use remote sensing to help us better manage water resources. Now let's, um, oh, but before we get to that, uh, just to make sure we are all on the same page, I'll spend the next five minutes or so introducing the technique I use, which is called synthetic after radar, or SAR. The type of satellite images we're all familiar with is perhaps Landsat images that we routinely see in Google Maps. And Landsat operates on visible or near infrared portions of the electromagnetic wave. And that's why when you look at a Landsat image, it's easy to interpret because it's just like a photograph. The type of um, satellite I'm working with, called SAR or NSAR, it operates on a much longer wavelength. And as a result of that, you have to uh, redefine what is brightness and what is color in order to understand what the SAR image is. SAR is an active data collection. <laughs> active means that it produces its own energy and uh, does not rely on the sun. As the satellite flies over, it sends a pulse to the ground, which typically illuminates a swath that is about ten, a few tens of kilometers wide. 
and it will then collapse the electromagnetic wave reflected back after it interacts with the Earth. For each ground pixel, the return is a complex number. Uh, it will record both the amplitude and phase information of the electromagnetic wave. And if we put all the pixels together, you'll start to get images. Um, for example, you'll get an amplitude image, and this is an, a SAR image of the San Francisco Bay Area. You can easily identify where the bay is, where the ocean is. And you can also see what the mountains, where the mountains are. They are actually very prominent features in SAR images. And this is because SAR is very sensitive to surface geometry. The side of the mountain facing the radar appears bright, and the side that's away from the radar appears dark. And in this figure, you can probably tell that the satellite is somewhere uh, on the Pacific Ocean looking to its right. Another feature that uh, SAR is sensitive to is surface roughness. A rule of thumb is the smoother the surface, the darker it will appear in a SAR image. A good example here is the San Francisco International Airport. The runways are smooth, that's why it appears dark. By the same logic, water bodies usually appear dark, as you can see a few pockets of water here and there, but the ocean actually looks quite bright in this figure. And that is because the image is probably taken on a windy day. Just based on amplitude alone, there is a lot of applications, for example, glacier tracking, tracking oil and oil spills or mapping wetlands, etc. However, amplitude is just one of the two channels of information that we record the other space. What phase measures is the distance between the satellite and the target. However, because each ground pixel contains thousands of scatterers and they're all randomly distributed, so the information from a single star phase image does not tell you much, it's just white noise. But when you have at least two measurements made of the same target, it will enable an analysis called interferometry and INSAR measures is the difference in phase measurements. And that is the color in INSAR measurements. And a first application of INSAR is to map the world's topography. Um, so when you have two images of the same target, but taken from different vantage points, the slight differences in that uh, two images will allow you to work on the geometry, and that will give you the information about the topo topographic height. And this technique enabled the first uh, global topographic topo topography mission called SRTN. This mission was able to map 80% of the world land mass with a resolution of 30 meters within an absolute error of 10 meters in just 11 days. And the total cost was only $150 million, which was much cheaper than doing land surveys and much faster. To this day, if you open Google, Google Earth and you find a point, you'll find the elevation information, and that data comes from SRTM. Another major application of INSAR is to measure the surface change. Imagine you have a satellite, but it comes back uh, at two different times to measure the surface, and during this time, the surface has moved by some amount. Since now we have a topographic model, thanks to the SRTM mission, we can model and remove the topography from the measurements, and what's left is deformation. This is first illustrated by the image of the 1992 Lander's earthquake. This was an interferogram formed using a SAR image before and after the earthquake. And what you see is a lot of fringes or color cycles here. Each color cycle represents 28 millimeter of motion because of the earthquake. And if you count the fringes, you can get an estimate of how much the Earth moved because of the earthquake. And in this case, it's as much as six meters, which agreed with detailed field observations. This also, for the first time, showed how the crust deformed kilometers away from the fault. And that uh, showed the full effect of an earthquake uh, for the first time in an unprecedented spatial scale. Since 2018, the number of SAR satellites has really more than doubled in both civil and commercial sectors. And one of the game changers is the mission called Sentinel-1, launched by the European ESA. 
In this mission, they uh, it generates repeat images six or 12 days globally with open data policy. So anyone can download it for free. And right now, we're expecting another major launch called NISAR, which is a collaboration between NASA and the India Space Agency Israel, hence the name NISAR. This mission is going to launch in a year or two, and it will generate 85 terabytes of data per day. Um, this data will be optimized for studying hazards and global environmental problems. To do better geophysical science, we'll need to sharpen our geodetic tools. Um, this is not the focus of today's talk, so I'm not going to go into it. But if anyone is interested to in learning about the geodetic, geodetic tools, I'm happy to talk about it later. Okay, so now let's go to our first topic, which is Cascadia's slow slip events, and we'll ask two questions. First, can we measure slow slip, uh, can we measure surface motion caused by slow slip events with INSAR? And secondly, can we translate this definition map to be to locate where the slow slip event happens at depths? Cascadia stretches 700 miles from British Vancouver Islands to North California, and this is where the Juan de Fuca plate. Uh, subducts beneath the continental North American plate at a speed of roughly 36 millimeter per year, and that is the speed of your fingernail growth, roughly. And the consequence of that 36 millimeter per year is every 300 to 500 years, Cascadia subduction zone will create a giant earthquake, the last of which took place on January 26th, uh, the year 1700. And that earthquake actually created a giant tsunami that went all the way across the Pacific and caused damages in coastal uh, villages in Japan. Since then, there has been no giant earthquake so far, but um, there is actually another type of earthquake going on and with surprising regularity. I'm showing here is a GPS time series of one of the stations on Vancouver Island. What you see first, is a long-term trend that's showing that the GPS station is moving eastward as a result of the subducting on the Fuka plate. What you can also see is this every 14 months or so, there is this reversal of signal, so these uh, seesaw patterns. And that was very surprising in the beginning. In fact, researchers were thought their instruments were broken. Now we know that these reversal signals are actually caused by a type of earthquake called slow slip events. They're just like regular earthquakes in that they release a similar amount of energy, but what's different is, as the name suggested, it ruptures very slowly in days or even weeks, and in some cases in years, so slow that people on the surface don't even feel them. So you might think, if we cannot even feel them, why do we care about them? Well, we care about them because they're an important part of the seismic cycle on a major subduction zone. In a play boundary, at different depths, we have different zones. At the shallower depths, we have the lock zone where the two plays are stuck together. And this is where energy is being accumulated and will eventually be released by a major earthquake. Deeper down, we have the creaking zone. And this is where uh, no energy is real, uh, accumulated and usually earthquakes don't happen. We want to know where exactly these zones are because in the potential big earthquake, um, it can rupture both the lock zone and the transitional zone in between. And the deeper the rupture, the higher the hazard is for inland cities like Seattle or Portland. However, because no giant earthquake has took place since the year 1700, we don't have direct data to assess where the lock zone is. The explosive events are thought to happen in between the lock zone and the creaking zone. Therefore, if we can get uh, some constraints on where the explosive event will happen, we can get some idea of where the lock zone is and where the creaking zone is. In addition, even though the explosive events themselves are not dangerous, they do change the stress field in the surrounding folds and the lock zone. So depending on where the explosive event happens, if they overlap with the lock zone or overlap with the creeping zone, it might mean the difference between triggering or postponing a major earthquake. So these are all the reasons why we want to know where explosive events happen at depth. 
However, it's obvious that we cannot really directly measure where it's split when an source event happens. What we can do is to use a elastic dislocation model that can predict when slip happens, how it deforms the crust and generates a displacement field. In other words, we can predict how the surface moves, um, which actually has a linear relationship between uh, the surface movements and the slip at depth. And surface movements is something we can measure. There are two main tools for measuring surface movements. One is GNSS, one is INSAR. GNSS or TPS, uh, to be a more narrow term, it is actually how slow slip bands were uh, discovered in the first place. However, it has its limitations, mainly because it's uh, sparse spatially. Even in Cascadia, which is one of the densest network for TPS, two stations are still at least 50 or 100 kilometers apart. In comparison, INSAR provides a spatial resolution of meters, which is much better. And another reason is GPS as vertical measurements has poorer quality than its horizontal movements, uh, while INSAR is most sensitive to vertical movements. And that's why INSAR is a complementary data set to GPS. In fact, there has been work done using INSAR to assess slow slip events, but in a different subduction zone. The 2006 slope events in the Mexican subduction zone uh, generated about eight centimeters of surface motion and was successfully studied by INSAR. However, there has been no or very few studies using INSAR to study slope events in Cascadia. And that is because for two reasons. First, the Cascadia slope events generates much smaller signals than uh, the Mexican one. It's typically less than one centimeter, so it's millimeter level signal. And secondly, um, because of the dense forest cover in the Pacific Northwest, it actually caused a lot of trouble for INSAR measurements. Um, so the problem is, to put, to put it simply, is low signal to noise ratio. However, we can solve this problem now uh, with modern INSAR data sets that has high quantity and high quality combined with um, the techniques we developed along the way to reduce noise, we're actually able to capture the slow event in Cascadia. And this is an example of the retrieved surface deformation using INSAR for a slow event that took place in central Cascadia in 2016. Um, comparison with GPS shows that they are uh, these two independent data sets agree with each other within uncertainty, as you can see from the three profile lines here. So the next, our next job is how to translate the surface deformation to slow slip at depths. We'll start with a 2D analytical model just to get some insights. The upper panel here shows the predicted surface motion, uh, both in horizontal uh, direction and vertical direction, as a response to slow slip at depths which I prescribed two centimeters of updip slip between the depths 30 and 40 kilometers. Now, if I can ask you to pay attention to where the slow slip event SSE zone are, which are the dash lines, and where the peak and trough of the vertical deformation is, you can see that they are almost aligned with each other, although not exactly. But this is evidence that Vertical deformation is very sensitive to where the slope event zone is located at depth. And with that, we can look at our deformation map again. If we draw a line and extract the displacement, which is shown in the black here, and by looking at where the peak and trough is, we can uh, get a guess of what happens underneath. In this case, we find there is about 3.5 centimeter up the slip at a depth between 36 and 53 kilometers. And the red, red dash line here shows you the predictive surface motion. And this is quite amazing because all we have done so far is a very simplified 2D forward model, yet the fit is actually quite decent. Now we can move on to do a full-on 3D inversion. And this is a triangular mesh representation of the play boundary, and the color shows the uh, solved slip distribution. If we use 45 degree latitude as the boundary, you can see that we can divide the slip patches to two, one north 
went south. And the North Patch is located at a deeper depth between 35 and 45 kilometers. And the South Patch is moved to a shallow depth between 25 and 40 kilometers. Now we have that. How does that compare with the TPS derived slip? So we went ahead and did a same inversion, but using GPS horizontal data. As you can see here on the right, um, the GPS inverted slip has the same patch, roughly the same patch for the northern part, but it actually does not resolve the southern part. And that is possible because that is possibly because the GPS stations are just sparse in that region, and also the horizontal movements are very small. Uh, because of the shallow access evil. And to another way to validate our results is to look at a, another independent set of data, which is the tremors, tremor locations. Tremors are <coughs> seismic, uh, basically seismic signals associated with explosive events. And by looking at, so this is the black dots, it's the tremor locations. And by looking at the spatial correlation between where the tremor happened and where the slip happens, we can see that there should indeed be a sudden patch here. So this further shows the advantage of using INSAR to look at slow state event models. Okay, so what, have, what we have learned so far. First, we have learned that yes, we can use INSAR to map the surface motion caused by slow state events, even if it's millimeter signal in a very challenging area. And we can translate what we measure at surface to what happens underneath. And we have shown that INSAR is a complementary data set, if not more advanced data sets to study slow-slip events. So now what? Well, so we have shown this is a single SSD event, but with the observation history of modern SAR uh, satellites growing longer and longer, we can go from monitoring one slow-slip event to multiple slow-slip events. And also, we can measure the interseismic velocity, which will allow us to do some comprehensive, comprehensive uh, slip budget analysis that eventually, hopefully, will lead to um, forecasts for seismic hazards in a socially relevant time scale. Now, let's move our attention to our second topic, which is another type of earthquake called trapdoor earthquakes that happen in a volcano. Um, Sierra Negra is one of the seven volcanoes in Galapagos, just out to south of the equator, off the coast of Ecuador and near the Galapagos hotspot. Although we have known for a long time that uh, the Galapagos Islands is highly geologically active, we actually knew very little about how extensive the activities are until the ERS SAR satellite flew over this area for five times between 1992 and 1997. And this plot on the right shows you the analysis of the satellite data. They reveal slight changes of the shape of the volcano as a result of magma withdraw or build up within the volcanic calderas. And these deformation maps are incredibly useful for forecasting volcan future volcanic activities. For example, Sierra Negra, which is here. It is one of the most active volcanoes during the observation period. It rose 240 centimeters, which is about nine feet in this observation time, and it erupted five years later. <clears throat> What's interesting about Sierra Negra is that not only was the deformation dramatic, it's also highly variable. These three plots here shows the uplift pattern of the Sierra Negra volcano during three consecutive time periods. As you can see, that the first and the third period, uh, the uplift pattern is similar in that the maximum uplift occurred at the center of the, of the caldera. However, if you look at the intermediate period, it's remarkably asymmetric, and the maximum occurs near the southern part of the caldera. And that is evidence that an earthquake took place in a pre-existing caldera, intracaldera fault, which I highlighted here with the black six lines. And this type of faulting is known as trapdoor faults, because if you think about the motion of the fault slip, and if you picture the caldera floor as a trapdoor, the motion looks like opening a trapdoor, hence the name trapdoor faulting. 
Using radar data of the uplift period, we were able to determine that this, this volcano has a silicate chamber with its top at roughly two kilometers deep. The horizontal extent of this, of, uh, of this chamber is also very well constrained. Uh, we know that the radius is about three kilometers. However, we don't know much about the thickness of this chamber. In fact, if you replace the silicate chamber with a diapia, that has the same top at the same depth, it will fit the data equally well. And this is not surprising because standard geodetic methods are only sensitive to change in chamber volume, but not the absolute chamber volume. In fact, uh, most geophysical methods are difficult to, uh, to estimate absolute chamber volume. For example, seismic tomography methods can map the uh, wave speeds and attenuation, but how to translate that into volumes of melt is not straightforward. And besides, the number and distribution of the seismic arrays will also limit its resolution. In this case, the seismic tomography method can review a deeper mesh zone, but it was not able to resolve the uh, shallow chamber. So what's special about trapdoor earthquakes? Unlike a regular earthquake that the surface deformation is caused by this slip on the fault, a trapdoor earthquake cannot be described only by the faulting alone. In fact, if we model the trapdoor earthquake as faulting alone, as shown by the dashed line here, the predicted surface vertical movement, which is the y-axis, will be all above zero. That means it only predicted uplift motions. This is not the case. In fact, for the 2005 trapdoor earthquake, three out of five GPS stations actually show downward motion. And that is because when the fault slips here, it forces the edge of the cell, the chamber, to open. And that happens in a matter of seconds. So you can assume that there's no magma coming in or out of the chamber, and there's uh, this conservation of mass. And as an instantaneous feedback to this slip, magma within the chamber starts to migrate to eliminate basically the pressure gradient generated by the false slip. So that the surface deformation will not only be caused by the false slip, but also caused by the instantaneous feedback on the chamber. And depending on how compressible the magma is, you'll have different surface response. When you have very incompressible magma, the, comparing to the chamber, the migration of magma to one end will means there's less magma left on the other end, and that will cause the chamber to close, which will result in surface subsidence. On the other hand, if you have very compressible magma, you can picture air if the chamber is filled with air, then when you open at one end, the air simply fill the extra space and it wouldn't cause surface deformation. So this tells us that how the surface uh, deformation on the caldera is, is controlled by this V beta M product. That's a product between the absolute chamber volume and magma compressibility. And if we can constrain the magma compressibility, we can get some idea on the chamber volume. So the first thing we do is to invert a combination of geodetic data sets, which composed of INSAR and GPS. And we solve for the slip on the fold and the opening of the chamber. And this is the bad fitting model. You can see that most of the slip uh, occurred here, which is uh, on the southern portion of the fold system. And the chamber near the fold opens, but away from the fold, it actually closes. And this coupled model is able to explain most of the downward motion that we observe in GPS. Now, if we assume that the magma has no gas in it, and that will be the least compressible end member, we can get an estimate of the upper bound on the chamber volume, which is 17 plus minus four kilometer cube in this case. Then we want to get a lower bound of volume, which means we need to get an upper bound on the magma compressibility. And to, to do that, um, we can obtain that by estimating how much uh, maximum exhaust carbon dioxide is in the melt. And we look at two sets of data. One is from element melt inclusions and submarine glass samples of a nearby volcano in the Galapagos. 
And the other is we can look at how the lava fountain height is because that's related to the amount of volatiles is in the melt. On the first day of the 2005 eruption, the fountain, lava fountain height actually shoot up as high as 300 meters. Both sets of data tells us <coughs> there is about 600 part per million carbon dioxide in the melt. And if we put that at the depth of two kilometers, we can solve that the magma compressibility is roughly twice as much as a gaseous basalt. So combining the geodetic and geochemistry data sets, we're able to conclude that the upper bound on the chamber is 70 plus minus four kilometer cube. And it, the uncertainty mostly comes from the uncertainty in fault chamber geometry. Uh, and that corresponds to a thickness of about 600 meters. And the lower bound is about half of the upper bound and it's about 60 times the volume erupted in the 2018 eruption. So we have now had an idea of how big the chamber is and what does that tell us? For one, it can help us to constrain magma chamber evolution models. Smaller chambers tend to erupt more frequently and will freeze more quickly. Larger chamber, on the other hand, can survive longer. And it also helps us to characterize future eruptions because when you know the total amount of magma there, you can know what's the maximum size of an eruption. And certainly, it will also give us some insight about similar volcanoes elsewhere. Okay, so, so far, I have demonstrated the exceptional power of uh, inside modeling to DSS to, to observe processes that we can't before. And I have also shown that integrations of interdisciplinary data sets are important for study complex systems. For our final, final topic, I'll argue that with both the modeling our data set and the rise in interdisciplinary collaboration, collaboration efforts, we are now well positioned to study water management, uh, water resources. So this diagram shows you the water usage in million gallons per day for different states in 2015. Um, Texas is actually the second largest in terms of daily water pumpage coming after California. 60 about 60% of water in Texas uh, comes from groundwater. And this percentage is going to go up because of increasing population and climate change. And using gravity variation data studied by the gray satellite, we can obtain an anomaly map uh, shows you where groundwater is being depleted, which is the red color here, and where groundwater level is increasing, which is the blue color. As you can see, groundwater depletion is not a problem unique to US. It's actually really a global problem. In fact, um, by 2050, it's possible that groundwater will be depleted in parts of India, southern Europe, as well as US. And to really cope with this groundwater crisis, what we need is to have information about aquifer structures and their storage capacities on a regional to local scale. However, right now we really lack data that can tell us about how much water is there in individual aquifers. How fast are we draining them? And how long can we use these resources until <laughs> devastating effects will take place? Groundwater is stored in porous rock called aquifers, and there are two types of uh, aquifers. One is confined aquifer, one is called unconfined aquifer. A confined aquifer is an aquifer saturated with water with both layers of imperme impermeable layers of above and below so that it's under pressure. That is to say, if you penetrate it with a well, the water will rise above the aquifer. Overdraft in a confined aquifer uh, can cause really dramatic surface deformation and irreversible change. It's possibly, uh, it's probably best illustrated in this historical photo of uh, Dr. Poland, who is a pioneer in a scientific subsidence study next to a telephone pole, where the land elevation in previous years were marked. An unconfined aquifer, uh, the other type of aquifer, is an aquifer whose upper water surface is at atmospheric pressure so that it can rise and fall 
a good analogy would be to think of a sponge, and if you soak it with water, it will expand. However, right now, not much is known about how much it expands and whether that motion can be detected by geodetic tools. One of my current projects right now is to investigate just that. Um, so I'm looking at two urban unconfined aquifers in San Gabriel Valley, Los Angeles, and I've marked where Caltech is and where Rosco is. So this is really close to my heart because I'm one of the 1.4 million residents that almost completely dependent on the groundwater that, that is provided by these two aquifers. However, it is really alarming to see that the water level in these two aquifers has been steadily declining for the past 100 years. For Raven Basin, it had, the water level has dropped more than 300 feet. For the main San Gabriel Basin, the water level has dropped more than 100 feet. And right now, the way we monitor how the groundwater level is, is by looking, uh, by using monitoring wells. And this is a map showing you where the monitoring wells are in this region. You can see that they're not really uniformly distributed. Um, there is a limited number. And most of the wells are only sampled twice in a year. And this is partly because monitoring wells are extremely expensive. One monitoring well easily costs between 100 to 200 solid dollars. And there are just under 150 wells in St. Gabriel Valley, and that will equate to $30 million. In comparison, the entire SRT admission that mapped global topography cost $150 million in total. So it's obvious that INSAR can be a much more cost-effective tool for studying for monitoring groundwater level. And we have found that indeed INSAR can capture both the seasonal and long-term movements related to groundwater level change. For example, we have found that the surface actually moves up and down as a response to water level change underneath uh, with a peak amplitude of five millimeter. We're able to identify where the recharge happens, which is at uh, the San Gabriel Mountains, and we're able to determine that the groundwater flows from the mountains to the valley in about a month's time. The long-term insert time series also tracks the movements in water level very well. Um, for example, you can see between 2019 and 2020, there's about 13 meter water level change, which corresponds to four centimeter about uh, uplift. And because of the incredible high uh, spatial resolution of insert measurements, there is always an exploratory part in my research because a lot of interesting features will just pop up. For example, if you look at bottom right, there is some prominent feature here, and they are all um, either uplifting or subsiding at a linear rate, and they're not correlated with water level change, so it's most likely they are related to um, an unmapped fault somewhere. And if you look at here, which is the Riemann fault, we actually find there's possible there's a transient event or a slow event that took place there, and it happened in mid-2018 when the water level in Main St. Gabriel uh, Valley is at this historical low. And this really shows that when you work at a local scale, you really need to consider all types of processes in order to explain your definition. Groundwater is only one part of the uh, freshwater balance. It is equally important to understand the other parts. For example, can we better characterize soil moisture? We have recently made this Exciting discovery that INSAR closure measurements, closure based measurements, can uh, actually tell us about moisture change. Um, it's correlated with fractification. So it will be amazing if we can use INSAR to uh, produce soil moisture products in the future. And there are some other questions like how do surface water and groundwater interact? How much groundwater is there? And where does recharge happen? To answer all these questions, it's also important to integrate different sets of data. For example, grace data can tell us the total change in water storage. Landsat data can tell us about the type of different limitations. <laughs> and it's also important to uh, compare results from different methods, so such as airborne electromagnetic methods and uh, seismic tomography methods. An extra benefit for my research is that a lot of the data generated can go straight into teaching. For example, for an, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is the other research direction site I'm also interested in. But yeah, for 
uh, an undergraduate class uh, such as National Water Resources um, with remote sensing. We can provide materials and real data in a way that we have a focus on earth science uh, concepts while students can practice and improve their data analytics and interpret interpretation skills. And in this course, we'll cover the basics in hydrological cycle and um, water budget analysis. We'll learn how we can use traditional methods such as well measurements and, uh, uh, and we'll also learn how we can use modern data sets like GRACE to characterize the water storage and we'll then move on to time series analysis with both GPS and insert data that tells you how to track the water level change with time. Um, we'll also cover other parts of the trash water balance such as soil moisture or rainfall estimation and a final exercise will be um, a student will have an opportunity to pick an area of interest to and then perform water resource analysis. And we'll incorporate field work into this course, such as field GPS or field gravity surveys. Another, uh, for an un undergraduate non-major course, I propose a course called Hazard Resource and Society, and we'll cover a wide range of hazards that our society is routinely facing today, such as landslide, flood, drought, fire, hurricane, etc. Um, We'll look at case studies, for example, Los Angeles, sitting next to the San Gabriel Mountain, uh, routinely faces the problems of drought, fire, and landslide. And we'll, uh, a challenge is really how to lead a sustainable life while dealing with increasing population and climate change and, and increasing demand for resources. And um, we'll emphasize on what remote sensing tool can do uh, to monitor and respond to disasters and we'll see how scientific knowledge affects policy. This will be a, likely a seminar style class so that students will be grouped and they will pick a subject matter or a case study becoming an expert in that and eventually be able to teach their peers. And finally, for our graduate level class, I would like to propose a course that discusses the fundamentals and geophysical applications of SAR remote sensing will um, cover how a radar image is formed from instruments to raw data to images. And we'll also discuss uh, how we can manipulate radar data to um, understand crustal deformation caused by volcanoes, or earthquakes, or landslides, all sorts of uh, geophysical hazards. And we'll focus on radar as a signal processing problem so that a lot of the techniques we cover in this class is transferable to analyze of other data sets, such as seismic data, or GPS data, or gravity data. And for this class, I'm thinking about a partial flip the classroom design, meaning I'll provide pre-classroom readings or uh, learning videos that uh, you're required to do before the class. And when you come in, we'll do a quick quiz, um, and we'll go over the quiz in class to so that both students and me will be will have a better understanding of what kind of concepts is the most difficult and will need more time to cover in class. And final, finally, I'd like to give a shout out to all my collaborators, without whom none of this project I've shown today will happen. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. We're right on time, it's two yes. minutes early. So. <laughs> Yay, um, so yeah, that's good. <laughs> so we'll probably ping pong back and forth between this room and, and online questions if there are any. Does, does anybody in the room have a question to start out? Um, so you're talking about the compressibility of magma. Um, obviously, if you compress it, you're going to have increased density. Do you have gravity meters or gravity studies to show that? That is a great question. Um, Oh, so I repeat the question is, um, is there any gravity measurements uh, related to the density of magma? Yeah. Uh, indeed, there is. Um, not not performed by me, but um, I think 20 years ago, there was this field gravity data, gravity survey that uh, sort of measured how the gravity changes with response to the magma uh, inflating and deflating out of, of magma building up and withdrawal from the chamber. Uh, and they did uh, compare it related to the density change. And they also did a similar compressibility analysis of magma. And they were able to get a volume estimate as well. 
Um, so in fact, the result is similar to us. Our result is 600 meters thick, and their result is 623 meters thick. Um, however, I have some reservations about their results because um, it's only like three geogravity data points they're having because it's, it's a really remote area. It takes like 10 hours to hike there. So it's, it's limited what they can do. And also the way they process their gravity data um, has some limitations. But I do hope in the future that we'll have better gravity data and uh, um, to incorporate some gravity data at least away from the chamber. Uh, all their gravity stations are within the Caldera station. So their reference point is not too far away. So that's all the reasons. But it's definitely one way to also tackle this problem. Yeah. Right. Maybe one more here before we go online. Tom, did you know? I had a question on the vegetative interference on the INSAR. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you see any seasonal variation, for instance? Yes, that's also a great question. So the question is about whether uh, there is seasonal seasonal impact by vegetation on INSAR measurements. Um, and yes, there is, uh, not particularly, not specifically to vegetation, but more related to groundwater level change. It, it's actually a great, uh, good source. Uh, well, it's actually a, a, a dominant signal that we see in a lot of places. So what I have done, I didn't show here in detail, but we do did a GPS analysis and we extracted the seasonal signals. Um, and we were able to see that for the slope events, that time period, on um, the, the the range of basically the uh, the impact it will have on our analysis is about three millimeter, which is not dominant to our signal. And for the interseismic one, it's more important to actually uh, model the seasonal part, seasonal information. And for that, it's harder to deal with. So what we do is to use pairs that is one year apart or roughly one year apart so that the seasonal effects will cancel cancel out. But yes, that's definitely a um, very important thing to model in, in our time series. Yes. Oh, great. So Lola, do we have any questions online? Yes. Zial, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Dr. Zhang. Very nice presentation. Uh, so my question is in one of your slides, you showed the uh, rough surge zone, transition zone, and the creeping zone with depth, but what is the depth scale we are talking about here in that slide? Um, yes, uh, so that's also a great question. For the locking zone at Cascadia, there's really not a, uh, so the common, commonly people believe it's about 30 kilometer deep. Um, so the source of events is believed to happen between 30 and 40 kilometers. And then below that will be the creeping zone. But there's a lot of uh, open questions in this area. Like, for example, it has been found that there is a gap between the slow event zone and the locking zone. So if the slow event zone starts at 30 kilometers, then the lock zone uh, is like zero to 20 kilometers. And then there's like this gap that we don't know what's happening there, essentially. But that's about the scale. OK, all right. Yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Do you have another question, Sloa, online? No questions online. Okay, back back to this room. Any questions? Okay. Hey, uh, good time. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question because I'm not that familiar with uh, use insert to measure the surface change. There were qualities related to the groundwater level change or the bottom change. Uh, you mentioned it's eight millimeter, kind of like the resolution is the eight millimeter of the chain, the ground. Ground caused by ground water. Uh, yeah, but you mean, I mean, in, in the slide you show there's some changes. The re uh, resolution is eight millimeters. Uh, we we have been able to see a five millimeter kind oh, five. of uh, fluctuation. Well, if you consider up and down, in total it's one centimeter. So it's like five meter upload, five meter subsequence. And what, what's the deviation of this, uh, like the arrow of this number? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not particularly sure about this case, but we do have noise coherence models that you can go ahead and you know, <coughs> ask us that. In this case, <coughs> I suspect it will be very small because this is one of the areas that's very suitable for INSAR because it's an urban area, the INSAR, uh, 
basically the quality of instar measurements are extremely high in this units. Yeah. It's better than TPS because of the vertical measurements are not very great in TPS. Yeah, but still it's done to me it's a really small changes so like yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, so and how we can I, I understand it <laughs> could be kind of indicating the groundwater, mm -hmm. maybe groundwater, but could be a combination of reasons. So <coughs> how you can there be sure is uh, indicating the change that's the yeah. rating. Yeah, that's a good question. That's actually very important in terms of insert study, how you interpret the data. Yeah. Um so one of the so yeah. So one of the way that you can be sure that it's related to water is if you look at this map, this is the seasonal, this is the peak amplitude map. Mm -hmm. And you so I plot it the faults and the boundaries of the basin here, and you can see it's very well constrained by the faults. So this is for example, this is an evidence that like because of the existence of the fault, it uh, constrains the water movements. Therefore, you can see that there's a fluctuation here, but not much here. And this correlation kind of gives you some sense that it is related to water. So it has to be a large scale. That's good. Otherwise, like a smaller scale, if you look at a very smaller area, like you cannot be sure. Like the larger, you would be more confident about this. Um, this is actually a quite small area. Uh -oh. Um, I, I have a, yeah, you can see the space bar here. This is 10 kilometers. So I think from this end to that end is like 50 kilometers. So this is a really local scale study actually. And we have really high resolution in this region. That's why you're able to see so many different features. I mean, it's very complex. Um, and but you're right that just by inserting alone, it's hard to interpret everything. For example, I have to like look at where the faults are, and I I, I have to go and look at what the well measurements are to make sure to understand what your insert data tells you. Yeah. yeah. Also, you know, when I go to some atmosphere, they, they basically use AI to predict the, the hurricane mm -hmm. when it will happen, right? Just by learning all those patterns, is that possible to, because it's image based, I'm wondering computer vision and those kind of algorithms that use. Yeah, there predict. are machine learning. Uh, it's actually a rising field, I would say, to insert stage because of the enormous amount of data we have right now. Uh, one focus right now is to use machine learning to uh, actually remove atmospheric patterns because they're kind of from one image to the other, the, the, the distribution of clouds will be different. And so they are technically independent with each other. And um, by using, um, I believe I reviewed the paper actually <laughs> in nature that's about how to use machine deep learning to remove um, atmospheric noise and that what's left is a, this really small slow set signal that you could not otherwise see from the front data. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, Saloa, do we have anything online? Um, let's see. We have a question from David, if you want to unmute and ask. Yeah, I've been having an audio problem. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, basically, uh, just kind of curious. Um, I like that you ended a moment ago with like a collaboration slide, you know, with who you've collaborated with, and it shows a really good kind of diversity of the different colleagues and entities that you've worked with in your present and past research. I was kind of curious, how many of those collaborations do you think you'll be able to bring to UT Dallas and uh, maybe other, you know, once you're in the Dallas area, whether industries or collaborations or, or funding sources, do you think you might want to try to pursue that might complement some of your future research aspirations? Yes, um, thank you for the question. I do believe that it's incredible, incredibly important to actually bring together different disciplines, especially when you study complex systems, either in terms like a magmatic system and volcanoes or aquifer systems. One set of data is just not enough to see the whole picture. Um, yeah, so I do, hope that we could collaborate on, um, for example, for a groundwater study, we would like, so my, my, my end will produce the surface deformation, but you will also need to get some sense of soil moisture and surface water. You also need to have data on precipitation. You also have to have hydrological models that tells you how the groundwater flows 
And if there's contaminant somewhere, well, how fast and where it will go? Um, so all of these questions will only be answered when you have a team of different uh, experts from different teams. Um, also, I, I, I forgot, I, like, I glanced through very quickly, but one of my um, interests is in induced seismicity. Um, and for, to study induced seismicity, it's obvious that you need seismic data. Um, you also need detailed geological studies of what the uh, subsurface um, structure is. Um, yeah, so all these will require inputs from different groups, and I do hope that I can um, bring people together to work on these kind of, or be a team member for these uh, very complex problems, but very important problems. All right, does that cover it, Dave? Yeah, it does actually. I like the uh, you know being able to collaborate with different disciplines and stuff like that. And, and I had the privilege of talking to her before the presentation, so she had already um, spoken quite eloquently about you know partnering with some of the industries around here. Texas is obviously a very big oil state, and a lot of these types of studies, um, you know, like, like she was talking about earlier, um, are of keen interest to my industry. So um, we had already spoken about that part of it offline, and so I'm glad to hear the other parts that she just brought up about collaborating with other disciplines within the university and elsewhere. So thanks. Great. So Lo, is there any other questions online? No other questions. Okay. I have a question. So um, I have a personal interest in the Cascadia slow slip events because my summer cabin is right underneath <laughs> them every 12 to 18 months. So um, you showed some interesting 3D inversions and I, I want to ask you a little bit about uncertainty and non-uniqueness because I know from time-lapse uh, monitoring of reservoirs, we have INSAR data deformation at the surface. We use seismic to measure motions, deformation from the surface down to, let's say, a reservoir. And we also have some wells with measurements. So, and we find that we're still not very good <laughs> at building a 3D model that explains all those. Mm -hmm. And there are various reasons. I think that there's, there's always one you need this, right? And we also don't know the geomechanical properties very well. So can you talk about the Cascadian versions here that you showed us? What, what are some of the things you do to <coughs> assess uh, non-uniqueness and uncertainty in your versions? Yeah, so the question is about how to assess non-uniqueness and uh, uncertainties in the slip inversions of Cascadia subduction zone. This is a quite difficult question. Um, so the uh, inversion I did is probably the, the simplest you can do. Um, I have a, a smoothness constraints and I use that to fit the data. And um, to make the GPS and INSAR data more comparable, I have the same kind of um, uh, weight on the smoothness. Um, yeah, but but to to really know how like what the, where the uncertainty comes from, this is a little bit difficult because um, for INSAR in this case the signal is really small, so there's a lot of uncertainty in the data itself. I actually have I didn't show it, but I do have an uncertainty map there and you can see that most of the uh, it's better with better constraint where you put your reference point that's another point I didn't cover uh, but, um, and and for um, and for this case another challenging point is that you have to have a preset geometry to work to work with um, and there is uncertainty in the model as well um, so there are um, my current group um, in Caltech there we are actually not me, but like previous students or experts in Bayesian inversions uh, that will that can um, have a um, sort of a recursive scheme to work work with both model uncertainty and uh, and and data uncertainty, and that will give you kind of an idea of how well you can constrain the slip results or how how confident you are of the results. Um, so that's for the inversion, and to validate the results, I think it's best to basically look at different data sets. I have to show a little bit with the tremor locations, but this is, in this case, it's a bit limited because it's just one source of event. Uh, what about you look at another source event that took place in the same area? Um, 
and a longer time, you can compare it with the inter-velocity inter map, inter-seismic velocity maps. Um, and all of these, I just think you need different data sets to validate your results. But yeah, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but it's an important question and it's a challenging one. And I do need you, we do need to, as a field, to try to uh, quantify uncertainties in insert data better. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. Any other questions in the room? Yeah. Can you explain uh, the concept of uniqueness to those who aren't geophysicists? Oh, yes. So, uh, the concept, uh, what is the concept <laughs> of uniqueness? Um, so what we measure is, for example, in my case, we measure surface deformation and we try to create a model like, oh, so if there is this slip of five centimeter on this part of the uh, depth, we'll create, it create exactly this kind of deformation you see on the surface. But does that tell you this is exactly what happens? It might not because you might have a different type of activity that can create exactly the same signal. Um, one of the examples I've shown is the Sierra Negra volcano, where you can have a seal-like chamber, so it's very thin, but you can also have a diapir that will give you exact same results on the surface. So that's kind of the non-uniqueness we're talking about here. Okay. Anything else online, Salora? Nothing online. Great. Well, we're right at our time too. So uh, let's let's uh, thank our speaker.